basically this presentation is how to help early stage companies to grow and what are the things that we all need to do to make them grow. Uh, having said all this, I must admit that please don't, we are all in the learning phase and as we will talk about it later on, the whole entrepreneurship uh, trend in India and venture capital fund and angels, these are all very early trends that are happening and we are, uh, you know, maybe 30 years behind uh, US or Europe in, in terms of the development of the early stage company space. So we have to, we are all in the learning phase. So it's not that we know everything and, and having four years experience is really, you know, not all that much compared to what, you know, incubators and venture funds and angels have in other parts of the world. So, so it's more of a discussion with you to, you know, to uh, share what are the challenges that we face and what some of the learnings have been rather than trying to tell you what to do. So this is of course the, the, the biological uh, definition of incubation. And uh, so when I first told my wife that I was joining an incubator, this is what she thought I was going to do. But uh, <laughs> uh, it's not exactly that. But sometimes, you know, the point is that being incubator manager, sometimes you want to act, do you act as the parent? You know, do you act as the parent to the uh, students and the people at the incubator or do you act as per the, the terms of the contract that you have signed with them or do you act as a professor and a teacher? So we'll discuss all about the actual the relationship between the incubator managers and the incubator companies and what is the most preferred uh, relationship that you build with the incubator companies and thereafter how you help them to grow forward. So today we're going to talk about, you know, mentoring and monitoring of uh, the companies, which again, you know, this is what an incubator is supposed to do. It, it monitors various physical parameters within the biological incubator and, 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 and adds, you know, increases the heat or, you know, increases the humidity and so on to help the uh, whatever is there to grow and then helps them along to reach the external world. So essentially see that they grow properly and then get them across to the external world. So that is really the process of incubation. Later on in the afternoon, we'll have um, one of uh, the incubators here to share his experience uh, through this process. So he's completed about uh, almost uh, two years at the incubator. He's recently uh, closed his first round of funding and he'll talk about his experience. To start with, you know, uh, we all operate in an ecosystem and, w w you know, just to give you an idea of what the technology entrepreneurship, you know, state is it in India today. Now, historically, we all talk about India is a nation of entrepreneurs. Uh, but if you really see entrepreneurship in India for maybe the last 200 years has been primarily trading and manufacturing. Very few entrepreneurs have really built technologies or products. Most of it has been either, you know, of course the trading is, is something which has been going on for many years. Even the manufacturing which happened in India uh, sort of took off after independence was essentially getting either a technology from overseas or which is, which is, which we call indigenous technology is copying western technology and applying it in India. And this is because basically the tariff barriers were very high. So foreign technology found it difficult to come into India. So a lot of companies built, uh, you know, their operating systems. There was a time when there were four or five Indian companies with computer operating systems. So you had that, you had in electronics, we were copying. In the pharmaceutical industry, we've, we've copied everybody's drugs. And that was how, that was what entrepreneurship was in India. The other was, of course, trying to get the, the other part of entrepreneurship in India was to deal with the government, get a license and, and, and start, you know, if you're the cousin of a politician or of a government official, you would get a license or, of course, either you were Tata or Birla, get a license and set up business because it was a, a supply-driven market. There was 
scarcity of you know steel uh, cement and all the basic things there was a so there was really no quote unquote technology entrepreneurship in india till very very recently so entrepreneurship that we talk about is essentially trading and we are talking about manufacturing which is also not technology driven but driven either by copying western technologies or by getting a transfer of technology and yet india has as we all know the third largest technical workforce and if 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 we start building technology products and and uh, so on we could really challenge and given the advantages that you have in india today one is the cost advantage the other that today india itself is a huge source of demand for uh, uh, goods and services if you take say the mobile space india is one of the largest uh, i think third largest uh, mobile uh, population in the world so just that huge demand could could generate potential uh, technologies coming in which are as you see a lot of new technologies are coming up in india in the mobile space because india is the demand is the market for such products and technologies uh, so also to understand that all the entities such as incubators like uh, us uh, the, the venture funds and the entrepreneurs we are all also learning this process because there are not so many technology entrepreneurs around in the west uh, there's been waves of technology entrepreneurs who then set up their venture funds or became angels and promoted the next set of technology entrepreneurs in india there are very few role models and very few entrepreneurs who become venture funds or angels to set up new entrepreneurs that's one of the reasons why there is a need for an incubator because that's what they really did these entrepreneurs in the west really help other businesses to create the ecosystem for early you know young entrepreneurs to set up their businesses by providing them money providing them you know the space introducing them to their business partners and you know people that they know that's what they did but it isn't here in india because we don't have that generation of technology entrepreneurs in india we do have entrepreneurs we do have people you know companies like wipro and infosys and and so on who are quote unquote technology entrepreneurs but all that because essentially what they have done is they they providing services lower cost some of them of course have helped other entrepreneurs to grow for example our incubator is supported by the ceo of uh, infosys but those have been few and far between and it's only now that it's happening and that's what could actually change what india has done till until now either copied the west or or got technology from the west or just traded that's what we are good at but if we start building our own technologies which we can sell to the global marketplace india will be a very different country than what it is now so i think that's what this presentation is all about so just to get into a little more detail about how each of the entity is operating in this ecosystem um so you know there are increasing number of not so many of them here but all of you want to set up incubator so there are in increasing number many of them have got funded uh, from uh, the government to set up the infrastructure uh, and operating as we we heard in the morning uh, from my colleague poini that building a sustainable business model is key you know to running an incubator uh entrepreneurs we are all you know the technology entrepreneurs are all first generation they don't have you know any business experience uh, also the lack of role models you know in 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 the us or in israel you can always look up to a bill gates or a, or a google or a yahoo to say yes there are you know there are role models for you to follow but in india there are very few role models and therefore we tend to restrict our imagination and it's like a vicious circle because there are no role models you don't 
you don't think big and that because you don't think big you really don't grow big and so there are no role models so it's a some sort of a vicious circle which we should you know it's again the role of the incubator to to help people to think big so that we get out of this vicious circle and again because of the lack of successful entrepreneurs from the technology space in the past there are not so many angels and because there are not so many angels companies don't get funded and, and here starts another vicious circle because because you don't have enough funds coming in there are not so many entrepreneurs wanting to set up a business because if 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 they have a product or a technology idea it requires to be funded but there are no vcs around so you know there are not so many entrepreneurs coming out of the system so again that's the role of the incubator to to promote entrepreneurship and here at iit what we try and tell the students is that today with with the way india is growing at you know 8% or per annum there is enough job opportunities if you are a graduate from iit or probably any other engineering college you will never find it difficult to get a job for yourself so we we try to promote entrepreneurship as a career option because you could start out something it doesn't work out doesn't matter you will still get a job we are not in the 60s and the 70s where engineers were you know still you could be an engineer still but still not get a job that's because our economy is growing so fast so here is an opportunity for students and even researchers to say the job market is so good that's the reason why you could leave it for a while and do something else and then always come back uh, and 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 rejoin it if if it so happens thankfully for us what has helped is that because the western world sees india as a big opportunity a lot of uh, you know venture funds and institutions financial institutions have set up venture funds in india so while we lack our indigenous venture capitalists and angels we've had inflows from overseas both at the private equity level and as well as at the venture capital level because they see india as a huge opportunity so that's is actually what is helping us despite all the vicious circles it's actually the inflow from the western markets and of course a few sprinkling of successful entrepreneurs uh, who have now turned vcs in india uh, that you have uh, money flowing in so there is money coming into india maybe right now for the larger entities but slowly as the venture funds and private equity funds compete at the the big ticket level some of it will trickle down to the smaller entities which was absent in the past so it's competition up between the venture funds and the private equity funds that is leading to money being available to smaller uh, smaller entities and early stage companies uh, i think both the business and the government have also realized that the sort of cheap labor economy that india has of you know sasta mein sab kuch karke we said it abroad is not going to last very long because now with for example with you know the intellectual property rights being enforced many drugs that indian companies are manufacturing you will not be able to manufacture any more and in other areas as well you know uh, so that's one two we also realize that the service as uh, economy whether it's you know software or or bpo and so on is increasingly getting falling margins you know the with the level of competition and from other countries the margins of top software and bpo companies is falling if you see over 20 years in in early 80s the margins of satyam wipro infosys was in late 30s and now it is you know 17 18 20% so it's fallen by 20% in the last 10 years so th and that's probably that's the direction they're going to go so that's all the more reason why both businesses you know big business houses such as the tatas or government is getting increasingly focused on entrepreneurship which is good for all of us because hopefully we'll get the money to set up our incubators fairly soon 
So there are a number of measures that the government is taking now. There, you know, this various agencies who've been around for a long time have suddenly woken up to finance innovators and uh, early stage companies. NRDC has come up with some schemes. Um, but Department of Biotechnology has certain schemes. DST, of course. So let's look at ourselves. Many of us are from academic and uh, research institutes. Uh, we do realize that there's a whole lot of intellectual property and technology and skills within our institutions. And unfortunately, they've been lying around like this for a very long time. It's not as though you know, innovators and entrepreneurs have just been born in India today. This has been going on for, you know, ever since these institutions came up. But unfortunately, they never got to see the commercial side of things. They're all there sitting in their labs and no one ever thought that it could actually become a commercial venture. And neither there were any government policies, nor there was an environment to set up your own venture, say 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. So, so there is increasing, um, as I said here again, there, there's a lack of role models. We had people coming over from various universities who have their incubators and uh, they were telling us that all, you know, uh, faculty members who set up their companies drive in, you know, Mercs and Porsches. So we, we unfortunately don't, don't see that many such cars in our educational institutions. And that's why, you know, faculty members don't think of starting out on their own. Finally, it's all about what you see in the world. And if you see your colleagues riding around in, in Mercedes Benzes, then you'll also start thinking, hey, you know, I could also do something. And of course, given the fact that there is no historical, uh, you know, um, you know uh, evidence of entrepreneurial activity, people, especially from academic institutions, don't want to take risks. And they would rather, I mean, I would say that uh, academics would rather put their money in fixed deposits than to put it in mutual funds or equity. So that, that's the sort of risk take. That's why they've joined the academic world rather than going into the corporate world because they've taken that risk. That corporate world, you could potentially lose your job or you, you know, you could, but in an academic environment, those things are uh, fairly certain and settled. So those are the challenges that all of us face. Uh, as, as an incubator manager, if you're in, in an academic institution, you'll have to fight all these things. So here we come to what is the relationship that you have with the incubator. So, so if, you're, you know, if you've been a teacher and you see your student and you're managing the incubator and you see your students coming into the incubator, you still want to start treating them as a student, right? Because that's what you've been used to doing. You know, you've taught that person for four years and suddenly the next day you happen to be manager of the incubator and he comes and you'll treat him like a student. And of course, you have also signed a contract with him or, or her uh, to say that they will pay a certain amount of rent and they'll give you so much equity or they will give you a certain royalty or on their sales. And then you start saying, you know, when a student misbehaves in class, you tell him, you know, hey, quieten down, you know, do what I'm telling you to do. But this is a contractual obligation, but you tend to still keep yourself in the role of a teacher vis-a-vis -a, -vis, uh, a student. And, and therefore, to some extent, you're, we always thought that our teachers are very strict. But you realize when you come into, you know, when they become incubator managers, they're not so strict with the students. And so sometimes you have to be strict and you have to follow uh, what you have contracted because if you don't do that, then there'll be many others who will also think that these rules and Indians are very good at bending rules and they will want to bend those rules and get away from it. And especially in an academic institution where, you know, you're, you, you're in a subsidized infrastructure, you think of it as another project that you're doing for the institution and, and try to squeeze the maximum you can, even from the incubator. I'm, of course, since I'm part of the incubator, I'll be a little harsh on the incubator companies, but that's what you might, that's the normal way an ex-student would, you know, he'll say, I'll say, be nice and 
give a smile to my professor and get you know a reduction in rent or not pay the rent and so on and so forth but can we do that the other of course is that we are you know we are finally running whether it's for profit or not for profit i think but finally you are running this as a sustainable venture right so you cannot let commercial consideration uh, get uh, sort of diluted by your you know it's not altruism it's not charity that you're doing here because if you if you don't properly follow all the commercial considerations your incubator will fail so the very house on which you have these incubating companies will go bust so then you won't be able to provide any more services so the the point of being commercial is not to to create wealth for your institution but just to ensure as we heard in the morning to make sure that your incubator is a sustainable business model that survives otherwise you can the next morning you don't have salaries to pay the professionals at the incubator and you go bust and and so do your incubating companies and of course the other thing is that you know the most of the companies are people who are in the, in their early 20s apart from of the faculty and you know they for many of us they are almost as old or as young as our own children so you you tend to become a little paternal to them which again is wrong because the whole idea of an entrepreneur is full of energy and want wanting to do new things if you try to have a paternalistic attitude you would tend to you know uh, sort of constrict his uh, uh, business and technology and so on so this is some of the things that we need to be careful about so while treading the path of um, you know helping and nurturing uh, entrepreneurship you need to take care of the commercials as well because if you're not commercially oriented the whole unit that you're managing will will, will not survive uh, so one of the roles of the incubator is to mentor and um, some of the things really come out from what we talked about the the ecosystem earlier is that we many of us don't think big and, and and it's not without reason we we went through the reasons why people don't think big and so it's again our job to make them look at bigger opportunities and because they are there we always think of okay historically we what we've done is we've copied the you know the loratadine drug and made it in india and made lots of money so we always think how is the is there easy way out without taking the risk to build a business and we see successful businesses in india you know you see the you know tatas and birlas who have really not taken risks in developing technologies they've just followed what the west does so what we do so typically what we do is there is a package there's a software package there's an erp package like sap or 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 whatever and say can we make a a cheaper um, erp package in india which we can sell so i'm not taking the risk i'm not trying to build a product which is different of which serves a different purpose i'm just trying to build a crm package or an erp package or any package which is already available in the market but i can do it much cheaper so everything in india works when it's cheaper so here is an accounting package here is an erp package a lot of early stage companies have done that in the past so uh that's about thinking big the other is especially people coming from uh, all entrepreneurs and and especially ones who come from a technology background have this problem of being too focused on their own product or technology so they don't really focus on the market they say okay my product is like we do to our own children you know our children are the best so is my product is the best and and you know if it's good if it's a good enough product the people will come and buy it so we are more focused on the product than on the market and naturally uh, we are more focused on the features so i compare my erp package which is 110 the cost or 100 the cost of sap and say i have almost the same features that there are 
in SAP. So, hey, my product is going to sell as much as SAP or, or Oracle. But, you know, the hard truth is that it doesn't. So, that's again not really the fault of the entrepreneur. It's, it's the environment which makes us think that way. And even if you and I were to set up companies, we would also think the same way because we, we come from the same environment. But the idea is to try and influence thinking away from that and focus on the product uh, and the market rather than the product and the benefit. What does it do to the customer or the client? How does it change the way things are done rather than on what features it has? Uh, just a little more bit on this business model is again a problem. The Indian service model is very well established that you can provide services and technology institutes and research institutes have people who can provide consulting services. A lot of companies who want to build a technology or a product find that they're not getting money from a VC or an angel and say that to, to keep, keep the business rolling, let me do some services to earn money, right? So they provide consulting services. As long as it is around the product, it's okay. But tomorrow somebody says, you know, you send five engineers and make them sit in our office and we will pay you 20,000 rupees a month, like a simple body shopping sort of exercise. There are companies who, who think that, that way. And that is the final death knell to the product business. Because the best people you will send to your clients and the business will go. I used to work for a soft, one of the first software product companies in India called Softtech, set up by IIT graduates way back in 1985. So they built, you know, uh, COBOL compilers, Fortran compilers. They had a um, Hindi software as well. Of course, they also took the easier way out. They built clones of Word, Excel, and, um, you know, DBase that was, was called those days. So they had this, and the business was tough, but the business was going. So somebody told them that, you know, can you send us a few engineers to the US and, you know, we, and we realized that we would get more money out of those engineers sitting in the US than for a month, then we, we earn revenues for a whole year. So those become, you know, it becomes too, you know, uh, tempting. And then you say, okay, fine. And then what you do is you pick up the best guys and you send them to the US. And they, of course, will leave in a few months from then. And so you send the next best five guys and send them there. And soon your product team is empty and you only have a service business left. And that's exactly what happened to the company. So it's now there are no product, it only does services. So that's what happens if you try to mix two business models, one of service and one of product in the same company. Getting VC ready. Finally, if you build a product or a technology company, unlike a services business, will unless it's like runs on word of mouth and you know it's like hotmail which gets acquired you will need money before your revenues come in and you will need and forget about revenues to you to break even still you will need more money so at least for the first two to three years your company will be burning money and again because the lack of you know the entrepreneurial infrastructure the money can only come from VCs who are willing to invest in you. We'll talk about VCs later on, and what they are looking at and how they make their investments. But essentially, at this point, I'll say that they are looking for businesses which, which could become $1 billion opportunities. And, and therefore, they are looking at not only the product and the technology, which we, as we all know is, is one, only one part of the entire business, but at the team, which is, you know, the other part of business is the team. So these two things need to be built at an early stage so that you have VC interested in you. Uh, the last element in, in uh, here is the world is networked, you know, in the sense that you're talking about, if you look at any big company, whether it's Microsoft or IBM or or in, in any other telecoms, they all have formed alliances. You know, the Microsoft and Intel alliance is well known. So, 
really without alliances you can't break make a big breakthrough in in any global market um, which could also be that you have lack certain skills and typically companies coming out from research and academic institutions will not have exposure to markets or commercial things it's not a bad idea for companies to partner with an outside entity maybe in terms of equity who will help them to market their product because that's the biggest challenge you might have a great technology but unless somebody wants to buy your product and if you don't know the way from the product you know how to distribute the product or how to sell the product your product will remain if not in the lab in the incubator so the point is and we have one of our companies here the faculty member who started a company and has now tied uh, given a uh, 49% stake to a company uh, in in a similar area to help them market their product so he's saying i know my technology best i don't i don't know how to do no problem so either you induct a person in the team who can provide that or have a strategic partner who can do that similarly a similar but a weaker form of that is getting mentors here this mentoring is different from the mentoring which an incubator does now if there are 20 companies in your incubator you cannot spend you know a defined amount of time with every company what early stage companies do is to get on their boards people advisors who have been in that marketplace or been in that technology area for some consideration it could be an equity consideration it could be a monthly retainer but it's very important so that you don't make the same mistakes as other companies have done in that space also the amount of networking and contacts that he or she may have in that space would be useful for the early stage company so these are the sort of things which early stage companies need to do very early to survive because this is what this is the foundation of their business model this is the foundation of their relationships with the external world and of course having said this this is not a one time exercise you have to keep on doing it because a lot of times early stage companies will go for a particular business model to find later on that it's not working so you know especially in the in in the dot com space all of us know that a lot of companies went uh, for you know what was called in those days the eyeball model you know get registered as many as registered users is concerned yahoo on nasdaq is you know the valuation of yahoo is at 70 dollars per registered user and therefore if i have you know a million registered users i'll be worth 70 million dollars but of course we all know that it didn't work and so companies then came up with business model such as subscription or 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 dif- or advertising or whatever so different models in one model a business model is not necessarily the one which will survive we've seen that in our own incubator where companies have changed their mid, uh, business model itself the target clients itself twice or three times over their stay at the incubator the early stage companies you might have a great product but who which person is going to buy it how will he buy it why will he buy it all those things you only learn when you go through that process so at the tactical level and and these are you know a uh, lot of problems which come up periodically for early stage companies is that you know you get one client and it takes you know much longer to get the next one or you know the getting the first revenues in takes much longer than you expect everything happens much longer than you expect except the way you spend money so you always spend money more faster than you expect and the revenues always come much slower than you expect so you have a lot of startups go through very severe cash flow problems and and you know and you have to be really keep the entrepreneurs going because as as the, we all know that they have job opportunities just an inch away from their incubator you know there are companies like infosys and wipro waiting to pick them on and here they are going through uh, 
not being able to pay for their own personal expenses. It could come down to even getting their next meal. Well, we've had that experience at the incubator. And yet their colleagues may be earning 10 or 12 lakhs you know, per annum and here they find themselves not getting to afford the next meal or to have a place to stay in, you know, not being able to pay the monthly rent for your place. So you have to find some way, in, there, are no, there are no quick fix solutions, but this is a problem which all early stage companies face. And, and from that comes the issue of a lot of, supposing there are a team of three, four people, not everybody's motivations are the same. And you might find in a situation of crisis, it could be cash flow, it could be some other problem, that the team dynamics changes. You know, and, and that, again, you have to catch it at, at a very, very, um, at the right point because if, if pe people break apart, it's very difficult. You know, pe people come up together very easily, but once they break apart, getting them together is very, very difficult. Of course, negotiating with VCs and, and um, you know, their commercial partners and so on is also important. Here, uh, there is, this is, you know, it's a million dollar question whether you, do you engage in their negotiations or you take a back seat? You know, in your enthusiasm, you might say, okay, no, I'll come along with you to the VC and sit and, 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 and help you to close this deal or I'll come and sit with you with the potential business partner and we'll close the deal. But by going with the, with the entrepreneur, what you are actually telling the person across the board is that this guy is still a kid. He doesn't know how to talk to you. That's why I've come along and therefore whatever chances that guy had of getting the funding or getting uh, uh, gets diluted to that. So the way that we've looked at it is to remain in the background, but of course be on the phone available with the person all the time, but not being physically present in, in those meetings, but helping them from the backside. And also that sometimes, you know, let's not, you know, we are not the only smart people in this world. The entrepreneurs are a lot smarter than us. Sometimes we forget that they're a lot smarter than us. Otherwise, we would be sitting in, in, in their companies, right, if we were as smart as they were. At the operational level also, early stage companies need your assistance, you know, just there are so many rules and regulations in our country set, you know, company formation, accounts, TDS, sales tax, service tax. We have more rules and rules for, and, and unfortunately even small companies have to do everything which big companies do. So it's, it's a huge task. And again, people coming from a technology or a product background have, have no understanding, interest, to do all this and what happens is many of times that they don't do all this and later on in life they realize that because they did not file certain things or didn't do certain you get into a huge problem we have we have a case right now you know where, where uh, the company is having a problem with another business partner and because they did not file certain returns on time and so they did not get recorded it's creating a huge legal mess for them and so rather than focusing on business, they are now working on, on this part, which is again very, really lethal for, fatal for an early stage company. Again, commercial exposure is not there for, for most of these people, whether they are from an academic, you know, from academics or students who have not really gone out and worked and come back. So you need to support uh, those activities. You know, all of, all of us learned accounting in one, one time or the other, or, or, well, we always think if the company is profitable, everything is fine. But it's actually cash flows which matters. You might have profits on the books, but if you don't have cash to pay your employees or pay for your next meal, then, you know, it becomes a problem. Biggest problem, of course, is because the Indian economy is booming and, you know, everybody is get, keeping employees is, is tough for everybody. And it's even tougher for early stage companies because they're not able to pay the same salaries and perks A to this thing. They also don't have the same brand and, and you know, facilities and opportunities really for, for early. And 
there was a time in the you know during the dot com days that a lot of people from you know premier institutes joined startups but after the dot com bust fewer and fewer people from you know engineering colleges and and management institutes want to join uh, early stage companies we are again hoping to change that trend but it's it's a huge challenge first of all attracting the employee and then uh, keeping him him or her with you because there are so many opportunities outside so sometimes the the economic boom also has its own you know uh, problems of of keeping people see when you essentially what is profit profit is the excess of you know if you sell your goods for 100 rupees and your cost is 80 rupees you made 20 rupees profit but the typically in a product company or or in any company for that matter the the, the your costs are incurred up front that means salaries you have to pay at the end of the month electricity bill rentals you have to pay at the end of the month but we all know in india that getting our money from a company or sometimes for many of us from the government takes many many more months than you originally thought it to so so that is really so you may be profitable so if i write my accounts the government has bought 100 rupees worth of software from me or my product for 100 rupees i'll get my payment in in 2 months time or 90 days time but during these 3 months i would have incurred 80 rupees of cost how much yeah you may you may um, so that so, so the important thing is to realize that you should manage your accounts in such a way that you're not short of cash at any point of time yeah you have to have enough liquid cash so you, sometimes you will not maybe sell to a certain client because you know that the payment will come after 3 months is better to pay to a client from uh, sell to a client where you get the money faster or that you budget that i'm selling it now but since it's the indian navy it will take me you know 90 days and another 2% additional cost to get my money out so i'll have to plan according so on paper your profits and everything will look nice but when you actually go and do it there'll be problems and of course how to get working capital loans from banks and so on is what would you would try to do for the company at that point of time because then for example an invoice from the government of india even though you you might receive the money uh, after 3 months a bank will fund that you know actually up to 75% uh, it, you know so as i said monitoring is like the twin brother of mentoring because if you mentor but not monitor you will really not know what what is the benefit or the 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 damage that you have done by mentoring the person so and of course we all know that you know the business plans with which people will you know come you know you'll always as i said underestimate uh, costs and overestimate revenues so that it happens most of the time and also that you need to change we had a company at the incubator which was focused on ethernet right and and uh f- which is basically wired networking you know whereas the market really moved towards wireless as we all know the whole market is moving towards wireless and and it did not change even though the technology was breakthrough they did not change their model early enough and they therefore one of the few companies which which you know didn't really go ahead so especially if you're in technology area things are changing extremely rapidly you might think you are at the cutting edge but you know tomorrow markets can change and and throw out your entire business model out of place so and it also you know finally tells us whether we are really doing you know uh, we're doing uh, doing a benefit uh, or or uh, damage to the um, uh, to the company and accordingly change and focus on a particular company and not really bother about the others you know that you say okay every 6 months we review all the companies and say okay for the next 6 months these are two three companies that we want to focus on who are facing some particular problems 
or you know that what are the problems each company is facing. So it's also useful for us as much as it is useful for the company to realize that there is some external person who is seeing how you progressed and, and opening a discussion for changing the way that they're doing their business. Sometimes when we are running our businesses with our eyes very closely on the ground, we can't see what is really happening at, you know, uh, 30,000 feet. So you need somebody else from out the outside world to come and tell you, hey, you were doing this. Maybe that's not the right way to do it. You, could, you may not, we may not know exactly how that business runs, but just being an outsider, we can add value as incubator managers. The other is as companies grow up from, you know, being, you know, a one man show to a team of people, they have to also get ready to go out in, in the corporate world where you have to make, provide information to all the stakeholders, whether it's, it's the government, it's your other shareholders, your investors, there are, you know, there are reportings that you need to do to all. So it sort of helps to inculcate uh, certain corporate governance norms very early in, in the life of a company so that when they go out in the, in the big world, they'll be used to it. Because we have seen, you know, not in the incubator, but companies who get funded by VCs in the outside world find it very strange that they have to send every 15 days or three months, they have to send a report to the VC. But we don't have that problem with any of our companies because they are used to sending us reports on a quarterly or a half yearly basis. And it also, you know, finally tells you, you know, six months ago you promised you would do two crores of business and you come after six months, you only done 38 crores or 58 crores, uh, lakhs. And then you start thinking, you also, the, the, the entrepreneur also starts thinking when he puts it on paper sometimes that where I had planned to go and where I have been. So it, it also acts as a way of, of uh, making him or her feel that there is something wrong that I am doing. So that's all. And then we can break for tea. <laughs> <laughs> to make you sleep. I think there are two parts to it and then we can talk. I think firstly, you realize that uh, the incubate as far as the profit and not profit, there are certain objectives which, you know, we, uh, sign has to achieve. And so those are, they need not be monetary in terms of profit, right? So that is one. The second part is that, you know, especially when you get into an incubator, firstly, you forget about designations because you have to work as a team because there are so many, especially if there are 20 companies, everybody has to work just as much, just as hard. So it's actually, and it's best when you work as a team or rather as partners. I think that's the real model is that the team becomes another set of partners who work together rather than there being any particular sort of extra hard work for the CEO or, or you know, less hard work for the CEO. Everybody works at the same level really. That's that's how I look at it. I don't know how other incubators work. This is how I work. Yeah. Not for profit. Essentially, is that whatever profit you generate, you don't distribute to the stake uh, contributors or members, but it plows back to the system. That is the so the conception. Not for profit is not that society cannot make profit. Hmm. We would love to make profit. And we is, make profits know, every year. That is yeah. one thing. Yeah. No, we can never. You can always create. No, no. Thanks. I'll tell it to my. You boss. have to show. You have to show profit in your book. You can't like in a company. You distribute dividend, right? Yes. You don't even section twenty five companies. They don't distribute dividend. But entire year earning, which is surplus earning, goes back to plows and gets plowed back to the system. 
so even at sign level we always think in terms of money every deal we look at it you know be negotiation with the vc on behalf of a company or whatever so like you know we also look how much money we will make out of it yeah so we are very clear about it that's one thing second thing is that ceo cao and all those things are designation but i think it is essential functional requirement one person takes care of business aspect because you require a business incubator also requires business right which means you have to get your companies so one we have scaled up to a level that where single person cannot manage everything so one person takes care of business aspect one person can take out. so that's a primary responsibility but we always complement each other as a team we are six people in the in the com, uh, incubator so it's not designation specific but more functional specific in smaller organization you can't go by designation yeah you know in in, in a company like as she rightly said in a company like telco or tisco you actually need there is a need for a hierarchy because it but for you know for about 5 6 people the hierarchy is is largely on paper it's more of working to, together as a team have a formal structure and define yes perhaps but i'm saying in terms of working you know at least in our case designations really don't matter you know but maybe because we are still a very small team if it's a team is of you know if you have a 50 a mem you know incubators in a company you might need to have a very structured hierarchy but not at at a small level and if you go across other parts you know venture funds and others they all have small teams and they all work essentially as partnerships in fact in the US VCs are structured as partnerships because that's how, how you operate. So each partner looks after a particular area, but you function as a partnership. After pre your presentation, what I could understand is that there is appropriate uh, staffing pattern required for a incubation, but that's what I could understand. Saying that uh, there are roles are very clearly being uh, done and for each of the team members, incubating company, I mean incubation center staff, has to be appropriately designed and there will be interest in the responsibilities and also I mean you have shown the way how it, uh, in different stages it has to go with, with. But staffing is one issue which is looking like I mean, appropriate. From an incub for the incubator managers yeah. or the staff of the incubator. Yeah actually uh, that's, De what I, that's my take away from your session. Definitely I think you know for example when it, we are we always say we are very lucky to have uh, you know a person from banking, yeah. a person from a legal background, and in the, this morning we learned how important those the structural issues are. You know, because that's the foundation on which you build build whatever the business and the operations. And we have a professor who has interacted with, you know, the, who's been interacting with students and so on. So yeah. we we actually have best of both the worlds, so as to speak, because because we have a good interaction with the rest of the host institution as well as have people with business experience not that it is rocket science business is different you know knowing how what are the you know how vcs function or how banks give working capital loans is not rocket science but for early stage companies it's very important to know the rest of the world anyway knows about it so we are not none of us are rocket scientists here but know enough to help the early stage companies to be able to deliver that to them and that's what is important. When I see Prostamana, I'm looking at tolerance for uh, even non-technical things actually. I mean, that's a very high for him like actually, yeah. unlike uh, most of the IIT professors where their tolerance for non-technical is. Yeah. And Usually, similarly, our tolerance for techno te technical things is also fairly high. So that's how. Uh, that's a great mix. In yeah, that's the right mix. Now, we are just fortunate and lucky to have.